Good morning. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm thankful to be able to share with you this morning. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 2. That's in the Old Testament really early on. If you need a Bible, there's some in the back against that back wall. If you need to borrow one today or if you don't have a Bible and you like a Bible, then feel free to take one of those. Uh, We're going to be in Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 19 this morning. Now, everyone in this room, me included, has a backstory. Everyone has a backstory, and it's, it's a story that explains who they are based upon their life experiences and based upon the relationships they've had and based upon the, the messages that they've received in life. Now, you might see or meet somebody that you admire or you look up to and wonder like how they became who they are or, or maybe you hear or read of a story or you see uh, online a story of somebody who did something very very terrible or horrific and you might also think I wonder what their story is I wonder what their backstory is their biography for instance many of you don't know this but um In the early 2000s, Pastor Scotty was a hitman. Those those muscles weren't for football. That was his cover. Um, He actually um, murdered for money. So just, that's not, no, I'm serious. He did. Some of you are going to be like, wait, no, no, he didn't. Uh, But the people of God also have a backstory. Everyone's got a backstory, and the people of God have a backstory. And where we find ourselves this morning in Judges chapter 2, I want to give you a little bit of backstory. See, there was a man named Moses who was a man of God who, who actually helped the people of God, the people of Israel, who were under captivity and slavery for 400 years in the land of Egypt. He actually helped them come out of slavery, the Exodus story, right? And we know that he, he delivered them, or God used him to deliver the people. And they went through the Red Sea, and, and God parted the Red Sea, and they escaped. And God saved them and rescued them. And then God led them into the wilderness where they wandered for a whole generation. For 40 years, the people of God wandered in the desert. They had to unlearn some things in, in from their captivity, but they also had to learn some things like obedience and dependence on God daily. And then, as Moses' time of leadership of God's people comes to an end, he raises up a young man under him, not so young at this point, but but a man named Joshua comes to lead. And and the mantle is given to Joshua, and Joshua takes over leadership of God's people. And, And so at this time, what happened was they are moving now from the the exile and the, the slavery of Egypt from the wilderness for 40 years, now into the land of promise that God had desired to give them. And as, as, as they move into this promised land, what happens is while under Joshua's leadership, the people of God do fairly well with one exception, that God had told them, as you go into this land, you are to remove the people of this land and tear down their altars and their places of worship. You're to to break them down because they're going to, if you're not careful, become a trap for you or lure or bait for you where you'll become ensnared or trapped. So, So he He fails, Joshua fails to do two things. He fails to have the people fully remove as God had asked him to do. But Joshua also failed to raise up a leader after them, after him. And, and for about 350 years, the people would be under the sort of the, the leadership or the guides of judges. Now, don't think like judges like Judge Judy or Judge Joe Brown. Like think like Captain America judge, okay? The word in Hebrew for judge is shaphat, and this meant literally a heroic leader. So yes, they would execute judgment, but it was really a rescuer, a a hero, and God would raise up a hero for them to save them and deliver them. And so what what we see is we're kind of leading up to this time is that when When the people of God had either Joshua or a judge or a good leader, they would serve God faithfully. 
And then what would happen would, was when Joshua died or when a judge would die, the people would sort of fall apart. They would forget who they were. They would forget whose they were, and they would begin to serve and follow other gods. And so began this painful cycle for, for hundreds and hundreds of years where they would serve God faithfully, they would forget who they were, they would fall apart, they would then follow after other gods, they would become enslaved, they would suffer, they would be oppressed, and then what would happen is they would remember who they were and that they belonged to God and they would cry out to God, God help us. And then God would raise up a judge, the judge would come in, clean house, take care of everything, get rid of all of the the idol worship and restore the people to health. And in that, they would follow God and serve God until the judge died. Then they would forget who they were, and they would fall back into idolatry and idol worship. And so the cycle would continue for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that's where we pick up our text this morning in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. So in light of all that, here's what it says. It says, after that whole generation, Joshua's generation and his leadership, after that whole generation had gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the people around them. They arose the Lord's anger because they forsook him and they served the Baal, served Baal and the Asherahs. Skip down to uh, verse 16. Then in their distress, then the Lord raised up after they cried out judges who would save them out of the hands of of their raiders, of their raiders. You, um, yet, they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly returned, or they quickly turned from their ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up for them judges, they would Uh, He was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. Skip down to verse 19. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. Following other gods and serving and worshiping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So what we see here is a a problem that existed in the people of God. And and it's sort of a universal truth for us at times too is that bad leadership or unhealthy leadership produces unhealthy people. You could say and make a similar point to the idea that unhealthy or bad parenting can also create unhealthy and broken children and families. Now that's not universal, sometimes there's exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, whatever leadership there is, whether it's leadership of a country or a family, it's really important to what they pass on. Notice what it says in verses 10 and 20, or 10 through 11. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord or what he had done for them. A generation rose up. They didn't know God. They just didn't know God. And why didn't they know God? Because it wasn't passed down to them. They, weren't, they didn't receive from their, their ancestors what, who God was. They had no concept of God and, and his love. And as a result, they forgot who they were. They forgot they belonged to God. They lost their identities and they served other gods. And we're given two examples of the the gods that were present in this time, in in this promised land, and that's Baal and Asherah. 
And these are two gods that would sort of pop up throughout the, the entirety of the history of the people of God that would keep coming back to. And, and so Baal was the god, um, essentially a god of weather or the god of agriculture. And so they would worship their god, the god of Israel, but they would also worship this god of weather and agriculture because up until really until the Industrial Revolution, so not even just hundreds of years ago, you were thought successful if you were good at growing things and selling those things that you grew. Agriculture really was the economy that ran the world. And so that, that was a, a big part of success. So for people to worship Baal meant that they were trying to worship to get good weather so that they could have good crops, so that they could take care of their family, so that they could be successful in life. So successful. The, the, the other one that that he mentions is Asherah. This was the goddess of sex and fertility. It was also thought and, and, and really considered that if you had a lot of children, you were blessed by God. You were blessed by the gods. And, and so also, if you had a lot of sex, you were also blessed by gods. And so you think they're wor worshiping Baal and they're worshiping the Asherah in hopes that they sort of look and be successful. And you think, oh my gosh, how, how, these poor people, how could they worship these gods? And until you realize that, that we too still struggle with the same idol worship, don't we? Don't we struggle with, with the desire to be successful? Don't we worship sex? Don't we worship the, the, the culture is constantly calling you to worship at the feet of Baal and Asherah? Success and sex. It's a constant pull. It's a familiar cycle. Pastor Scotty talked about this last week, that, that when we in this world forget who we are who, and who we belong to, when we forget about God or we are rejected by man, what happens is we tend to look for our identity in other things and other people. He talked about five Ps, power, positions, possessions, performance, and people. And he spent most of his time talking about people and what a lure people are to us, right? But when you forget who you are, when we forget that we belong to God, we will find our identity in other things and other people. And we just don't call it idol worship, but it's still the same. And we find ourselves in this cycle. Notice what he said. He said, he said it was the ancestors. If you read and go back and read chapter 2 uh, of Judges through, you're going to see the word ancestors come up six or seven times. And, and I think a better translation, some of your translations might read fathers. And, and I think it's important to realize that's a better translation um, because God's intention was and still is, is that identity and security is passed down through the generations through our heavenly father, first and foremost, and through our earthly fathers. Yes, and mothers too, but through our heavenly father, through our earthly fathers, that that is where faith is passed down from. That was the way the people of God worked back then. That's the way God would intend for us to work now. But there's a problem with that, as you can imagine. Not all of us fathers have done a good job of passing on faith, have we? And this morning, I want to be really, I want to challenge the men in this room. Whether you're a young, young man, whether you're an old man, sorry, I'm going to call you an old man. That's fine. Get over it. You're fine. You're old. <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm aging. I don't know. I don't know how you, I'm, whether you're a young man or an old man, I, I, I want to challenge and speak to you this morning. I'm going to say some really hard, uh, harsh things, and I honestly, uh, I want to say, you know, sorry, not sorry. I want to challenge you this morning. And it, women, you're not off the hook. You know, I, I'm praying, been praying for you all week that you receive something. But can I be honest? Most women, not all, most women, most moms have done an amazing job of trying to pass down faith in a, in, to generations. So I thank you for that but I want to challenge the men this morning because I think that's what the word of God would have us do is to challenge the men because the truth is, is that the formation of the family is, is in large part by the active role of the husband, the father, and the men in the formation of the family and the formation of the community. 
So what happens when faith and identity and security isn't passed down to the fathers? Well, I'm going to give you some stats. I'm going to give you some things to chew on a little bit. And you can write them down if you want. You can fact check me later. That's fine. Or we can talk about it later. But um, here's some stats for you to consider and to think about. Uh, in terms of going to church, when, when the mother and the father both attend and are active and involved in church or active in their faith, there's a 72% likelihood that, that their children and those follow after them will follow in the faith. 72% of the time, if you have an active mom and an active father actively living out their faith, 72% of the time, their, their children and their families will follow. If, if just the mother is active in her faith and going to church, there's a 15% chance, a, a dramatic drop. And that's not because moms aren't doing their job. There's a dramatic drop. If just the father, no mother is involved and the father is active in his faith and he's attending a church and he's engaged in his faith, there's a 55% chance that the rest of the family will follow. How about finding faith, coming to faith for the first time? Well, the stats are this, that, that, that if the child comes to faith first, first and that's kind of how it happened in my life growing up, my, I came to faith and then other people in my family came to faith after, but, but they're, they're sort of, if the child comes to faith first, there's a 5% chance that the rest of the family will follow along. If the mother comes to faith first, there's a 22% chance that the rest of the family will follow along. If the father comes to faith first and leads his family in faith, there is a 93% chance that the rest of the family will follow. You're telling me there's not a significant responsibility and role in the family. Okay, let's throw out faith for a minute. Let's just talk about the rest of life. What's the effect of a fatherless home What's the effect of a father that's not present and active in the life of a child? I, I want to give you some of those too. Because here's the truth. The spiritual and psychological formation of the son or the daughter is directly uh, tied to the engagement of the father. Not just the presence. It's not enough to just be physically present, but to be present and engaged Here's the, here's the stats on some of that. Some of that, 80% less likely to go to jail if you have an active and present father in the home. 75% less likely to experience teen pregnancy if you have an active and involved and engaged father in the home. When the father is engaged and close to their kids and their teens, those teens have a 50% less likelihood to experience anxiety and depression. 50% less likely. Fatherless children are more likely to drop out of school. Fatherless children are more likely to have experienced some sort of abuse, sexual, emotional, physical abuse, and they are more likely statistically to abuse substances later in life. It matters. Not just your presence, but your active presence matters. All the science and all the psychology backs up what I'm saying, but here, even more importantly, the word of God has been telling us from the very beginning. The very, very beginning. We know from the scriptures from Genesis and even all the way to uh, Romans chapter five, verse 12 says that sin came through one man, through Adam, our first father. Who, who, took, the, who took the fruit and ate? Eve. Who did God hold accountable and responsible? Adam. Why? Because he was given the responsibility and the accountability first. He's not more important than Eve, but he was given the accountability and the responsibility to protect the family, to protect his wife. And he was held accountable. Romans 5, 1, or 5, 12 says that sin came through one man, Adam, and that sin destroyed us all. Now, everyone from that moment on, the moment you and I were born, we're born into sin. We're born into this destruction that sin caused. But it's through Christ and his work on the cross that we can be redeemed and made whole and to make a change in that trajectory, that, 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 that path can be made new. Each generation is impacted by the generation 
that came before him. I think also as I think about the creation story, I think about Adam and Eve, and I think about his inability to protect his wife. And I'm not, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm picking on us men, but at that moment in time, and I know God's plan of redemption is bigger, and he saw all this, and he saw us, and he saw you, he saw me, but I can't help but think that, that what should have happened in that moment was for Adam to step in between the serpent and his wife and say, hold on, we don't talk to snakes. And we don't eat from that tree because that's not who we are. That's not what God told us would be healthy and good and best for us. We don't do that. I love you, babe. I don't know what Adam called his wife. Honey, sweetums, <laughs> schnookums. I don't know what he called her. I'm sure he had some kind <laughs> These kids just cringe down here, and they're like, oh. An adult man just said, schmuckums, oh. Um, we don't know what he called her, but, but at that moment, he should have stopped her and said, no, 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 we don't do that. That's not good for us. But he just looked on with approval. Maybe he was trying to please his wife. I don't know. My, but he didn't step in, and he didn't step up. And there's not an evil in this world today that's not been committed and I can't, I'm going to say this, this is bold, I'm saying it's from the scripture, this is my opinion. I'm, there's not an evil or, or, or a destructive thing that's happened in this world that can't be tied back to the inability of a man doing his job, a husband or a father. I stand condemned too in my inability to lead at times my family but we're responsible. And this isn't about assigning blame or shame. I don't, I don't think that's helpful, but it is about accountability and responsibility. Romans 3.23 says, we all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are exempt from this. So what's the answer to this problem that's plagued humanity? It plagues us for thousands and thousands of years. Well, I think it all has to do with affirmation. Affirmation. We'll start with the, the, the most important affirmation. Turn, turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. This is the story. We looked at it last week a little bit. And, and the baptism of Jesus. This is the moment where Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist. And verses 16 and 17 show us something so profoundly beautiful about Jesus. His, his baptismal moment. It says this, Matthew 3, verse 16 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. Baptism was the, is the, the symbolic nature of being, being buried and born again, raising to new life, old gone, new come. It, and so it says, as he is coming up out of the water, at that moment, heaven was opened up. Can you imagine for a moment? I want you to think and imagine that for a moment, that, that heavens open up over Jesus. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know what that was, but it just the, the, the sky cracking open in such a beautiful and profound way that a beam of light, it says that, and alighting on him, so heaven open, was opened up and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove, we don't know if it's a dove fully, but it was like it looked and perceived like a dove, and a dove was a symbol of peace. So light and life and peace are shining on Jesus as he comes up out of the water. <coughs> Excuse me. What an amazing scene. And a lighting on him, verse 17, and a voice. An affirmation is a voice. An affirmation is, is spoken. An affirmation is given, a voice from heaven. God the Father says this, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What a beautiful moment of affirmation for Jesus. What a beautiful moment. To, so affirmation literally means to confirm the truth about something or someone. To affirm is to speak truth to confirm the truth or the validity of something or someone. 
or about something or someone. In this moment, the Father, the, the God of all creation is affirming his connection and his belonging to the Son, Jesus. Their relational connection. He's, he's saying, he is mine. I see you. He belongs to me. That's my boy. He belongs to me. And he says, I love him, meaning he, he finds value in him. Remember also, this is before Jesus um, has done a whole lot of his miracles. It's before he's done public teaching. It's before the cross. It's before his death and resurrection, his ascension. He hadn't performed anything yet. He hadn't done anything for his father to be proud of. His father was proud of him and who he was. He affirms Jesus. And I thought to myself this week, well, why would in the world, if Jesus is fully God, why would he need the affirmation of God the Father? Why does Jesus need the affirmation of God the Father? I, I think it's because Jesus, although fully God, was also fully man. So the affirmation, the public declaration of the Father that he belongs to me and I love him was for Jesus' humanity and it was for the rest of us in humanity that this one belongs to me and that's my son. I love him. That's the affirmation of the Father, the power of that affirmation. I am well pleased. I'm proud of him. I delight myself in him. God says, I see you. I love you. I'm with you and you've got this. Now, if you asked me, if you came up to me this morning and you said, Matt, can I have a million dollars? Well, I mean, depending on how much I like you or not, I mean, I, I don't have a million dollars to give you. Now, if you needed like $38.12, like I could help you with that. Like that would probably work. Uh, don't get any ideas, kids. My kids don't. I'm not giving you $38 either. But I can't get... As much as I desire to give you a million dollars, as much as you might need a million dollars for whatever it is that you need it for, I can only give that which I have received and have abundance of, right? If I was a billionaire and you came and asked me for a million dollars, depending on the need and, and who you are in our relationship, I might go, yes, absolutely, sure, I'd love to give you that because I have received or I have what you need, and I have received that so I can freely give it. But we can only give what we freely receive or accept it. And so the same is true with love and identity and security. It comes first and foremost to our heavenly father. It comes down so then it can go out, right? Because the affirmation of God is first and foremost but the affirmation of us to each other is paramount to our development and who we become. But if I don't give what I haven't first received, then what I give will be tainted. What I give will be dis distorted. It won't be healthy. It won't be whole if what I'm giving you isn't what I've received from God. Does that make sense? It has to flow this way before it flows this way. Because if it flows only this way, apart from this, it can also do a lot of damage. It could do a lot of damage. Here's the point. The point is that you'll pass on what you've received, either positive or negative. Your backstory is the result of what you have been given or received, both positive or negative. You are a byproduct of the affirmations you received or didn't receive. You're like... I imagine some things are coming to your mind right now of what that looked like for you. The affirmation of God must first and foremost come through the word of God, through his, his word and through the word received from him. But if affirmation means to confirm the truth about something or someone, then we better be clear about what the source material is, the truth Jesus is the truth, the word made flesh, the manifestation of the word or the affirmation of God. So we first and foremost have to receive this way before we go this way. But once you've received this way, now we're talking about how we receive or how we give 
affirmation this way. So affirmation must come from God and then it must flow from, from God through us to others in order for it to be healthy. I want you to think about a baby for a moment. A baby, a baby can't um, pick up the scriptures and read for themselves that God loves them. How, how does a baby know that God loves them? <laughs> moms, <laughs> no. moms, right? <laughs> no. They know through connection. They know through attachment. They know through security being exemplified through their caregivers, through their mothers, and through their fathers. You know that children that don't have affirmation or connection, babies that are orphaned, that don't have connection, physical touch, and physical connection, often will get sick and die? That's because the affirmation is is physical. So, So, affirmation comes even as a baby and and little children, they can't pick up the script. Did you know that most people don't have the luxury that you and I have now to have Bibles that we can walk around with or on our phones? For, For most of humanity and most of history up until the last 100 years or 200, 300 years, they didn't even have the ability to read the scriptures on their own. They had to go to somebody like a church or, or a pastor or somebody that, that was educated that could speak the word of God over them. And now we're so spoiled we have it and we don't even use it or listen to it. But affirmation comes through relationship. It comes through connection. But it's got to flow this way before it flows this way. So a baby learns they are loved by God, by by their parents knowing who they belong to and whose they are and that love being given or extended to others. Now, as your kids get a little bigger, little boy, little girl, what happens is, is that if we don't receive this way, then this way, what happens is we begin to train them in the ways of those five Ps. We begin to affirm, here's here's what we do. We we affirm the right things in the wrong order. We affirm the right things in the wrong order. We talked about last week, uh, possessions aren't evil or bad. Positions aren't bad. People aren't bad. Performance isn't bad. Uh, These aren't bad and evil in and of themselves, but with the wrong priority and the wrong perspective, they can be completely damaged to a person's soul. And so what do we do to our children? We go, oh, you're so strong. Our young boys, we tell them we're well, strong, or we tell them stop crying because you're strong, right? And we send mixed messages, and we tell our little girls you're beautiful and you're pretty and you're smart and you're this and you're that, right? And all those things are good, but given their wrong priority or their perspective without understanding that they first and foremost are loved by God, they will think their identity is in their performance and what they do. And so all of you, whether you're little or old now, you're me, you're middle-aged, I don't know what I am, but uh, you're middle-aged, um, your whole life, your backstory is a byproduct of all of the mixed messages you got along the way that said that you have value if fill in the blank. You have value if you perform well, if you provide well, if you are financially successful, if you are handsome, if you are beautiful. And we have found our way around the world trying to confirm these feelings, these affirmations without tied to or divorced from the affirmation of God. And when it's divorced from the affirmation of God, we think it's on us. And thus, we, like the people in Judges, get into the pain cycle of forgetting who we are and following after other gods. And who is responsible to keep this going? And I will say it's the fathers. And now, you might be in a home where you don't have a father present. And I'm sorry for that. That's a painful reality of a broken world. But there are father figures, there are people who God will place into your life that will speak the word of God, his affirmation about who you are. Because here's the thing, women, I'll just tell you, women, 
Whether you like it or not, your beauty will fade. That's biblical. I didn't say that. Like, that's, you, take that up with, you take that up with Jesus. I didn't. Beauty's fleeting. So if your whole entire life was based upon the predicate that you are pretty and desirable, what happens when you stop being pretty and desirable to people? Your identity is demolished. Men, w- when you can't perform anymore, you're not playing sports, or you're not building a business, or you're not building something, what happens when you're unable to do that anymore? Is your identity demolished? because it wasn't found first and foremost this way. This is is real, this is real life. It, 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 It just continues to surface in these ways. And I I don't know your backstory, but I do know how the Heavenly Father sees you and what he desires for you to become, not just to do. I, I meet with hurting and broken people Every day, every week, I too have been and am a broken person. And, and I do counseling and care and, and not all the time, but almost every time. As we get into the backstory, what I find is at some point there was a failure of the father to do what God had called them and created them to do. And some of you I know are still, you're, you're still unwinding in uh, years and decades of messages that you received or didn't receive from your fathers. But it's important to go back to the source, your heavenly father. This is why so many of you have a hard time accepting and receiving God's fatherly love because you've received very broken and tainted and distorted versions of love's from your earthly fathers. Very conditional love. So when people say, hey, God, the Father loves you, you you don't have a concept of that. You can't connect to that. It doesn't register to you. But if you have an earthly father who loves the heavenly father who is received by grace through faith Christ and forgiveness and wholeness, then you got a shot at understanding what it means to be in relationship with your heavenly father. But man, I want to speak to you and just say, don't settle. You know, sometimes us men, we settle for passing on our politics and our hobbies. We're just like, that's, that's what we do. We pass on our politics and our hobbies, and we call that a success. We're a successful father. Or sometimes we define success as men by uh, provision and protection physically. Well, I provided for them, ungrateful kids. I protected them. I kept a roof over their head. I kept them shielded. What else do you want? Well, can I say that they want your protection and your provision emotionally, spiritually? It's more than just physical. That's a great, that's like like the, the lowest, that's like the foundation for which you build upon. That's not the end goal. It's about passing on your faith to the next generation, about being responsible and accountable as a man because your word and your voice matters to them. So we first have to go back to the source and invest in the time that it takes to pass on love and life. We have to receive, (coughs) excuse me, that which we receive, we will be able to freely give so that we can look at our sons and daughters. We can look at each other and say, I see you. I love you. You belong to me. I'm proud of you. Don't, don't tell me that there's not, there's not a person in this room right now that does not come alive or would not come alive at the words, I'm proud of you and I love you, given by their father or their mother. Some of you feel so lost because you haven't received that. Desperate for that. but we've got to be able to give that. And it's never too late to start. If you've been terrible at this your whole life, God loves you. And the reason you're terrible at it is because you probably didn't have a good example or the right resources. 
So it's never too late to start. Repent, change, draw near to God. I think about myself, I think about a lot of very imperfect fathers in this, this room in our church. We have some amazing dads in our church. Now, can I just give you a little bit of props? Can I, can, yeah, we, do we don't we? We have some amazing fathers and dads in this room. Can I, okay. I don't, I don't want to pretend like it's all, all bad and all doom and gloom. There's some really imperfect fathers. I think about uh, Larry Cannon. I, why are you laughing? Why is that a laugh over there? There shouldn't be a laugh. Larry is amazing. I see, his, I, see his, I see his kids involved. I see his kids connecting and growing. I know. I, 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 see, I, I see Chase Coop being a part of his son's baptism and affirmation and calling. I, I've seen Michael Freed. I've seen young fathers love on their kids and, 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 and teach them what it means to walk with God. Carlos Contreras, who's in my group, he's got three young girls. Pray for him. Um, <laughs> lo- doing his best to love his family and lead them. I think about Pastor Scotty. He would never claim he's a perfect dad, but gosh, you got four girls and two boys. Holy cow. Like, I see him love on those girls. I see him love on his daughter's as perfectly as he can in, in, in his brokenness and his own imperfection. I see it. I think about Steve Munson and KOZ in our ministry to young boys, 8 to 18. If you know Steve, and Steve's in my, my men's group on, on Wednesday nights, which men, if you need a group, Monday mornings, Wednesday night, there's, there's a place for you. But, but Steve Munson, who, who leads and oversees our KOZ ministry to boys, if, if you've not seen or been around or, or, or know what, what they do, it's amazing what they do with young boys. What are they doing? They're affirming who they are. They're affirming their belovedness to God the Father. They're affirming uh, their masculinity, their, their, their strength. They're affirming their Steve is passing on, and if you know Steve's story, he didn't have that example of of it being passed on to him, but he's redeemed by the grace of God to now be a conduit of grace to your boys and my boys and our boys here at this church, and I'm grateful for him. I think about Jim Hallahan, who is a... um, a judge, a, 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 a hero, <laughs> in, a, a heroic leader in my mind, in my eyes. He, here's a man, if you don't know Jim, if you haven't been blessed to know Jim like I have now over the last year, here's a man who self-admittedly caused a lot of damage to his family for the first 30 years of his life. And the last 30, 40 years of his life, he has spent committed and dedicated to knowing the Father through his word and passing that on to his kids, his grandkids, and his great-grandkids. It's not too late, men. God is doing a work. God will do a work in and through us, and it's not because He doesn't care, but I'm telling you, men, we have a tendency to gravitate toward either abuse or apathy or or avoidance. We, We get either harsh or overly critical or angry and overbearing and dogmatic, or we just give up and and sort of avoid. And I'm telling you, there's a better way. And it's, it's through first and foremost receiving the love of the Father and then giving that freely to others. So men, I want to encourage you, get involved in KOZ. Get involved in children's ministry. Serve in children's ministry. That's an idea, right? We need more people to help. The men should be stand, stepping up into that. I'll help. I'll help serve. I'll help connect. Can I give you the gospel for a moment? Can I give you what, what, what Paul said in, in Romans chapter 8? I want to give you the gospel. And then I'm going to give you some soul work, homework, like Pastor Scotty gives us. I'm, I promise we'll get there. But can I, want, can I give you the gospel? 
for a moment, it's this. In, in Romans 8, verses 14 through 17, it says this. For those of us, for those who are led by the Spirit, we've been talking about being life in the Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit, those who belong to God via His Spirit, are children of God. Everyone in this room, if you've received by grace through faith, Jesus as your Lord, you receive the Holy Spirit. You belong to God. You're God's child. Whether you're eight or whether you're 80, you're God's child. And he says this, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. You are not called to slavery anymore. You are called to freedom, to be free and to set others free. He says, the spirit of you that does not make you slaves so that you may live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received bought, brought about your adoption to sonship, your adoption to sons and daughters of God. And by him, it says, we cry out, Abba, Father. It's not God and, and so discount. No, we cry out, Father. He says, we cry out, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. If we are heirs, we are co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. If you belong to God, you are his child and you are co-heirs with Christ. You have received from God everything you need to give freely to others and freely to give to your family. That's the good news. That's the gospel. By his grace, we are saved. So what's the soul work? I want to give you some, some questions to ponder and to think about, and then we're going to pray and respond. Question you might ask and wrestle with this morning is what did I receive from my father or father figures growing up? What did you receive? Did you receive affirmation? Did you receive condemnation? Did you receive silence? Nothing. What did you receive? And how did that affect you? And then what have I affirmed or what have I been giving to others? What have I been affirming in others? And is its source God himself first? And I want to encourage you to spend time with your heavenly father every day. You know, the Bible says that Jesus often withdrew. Every day, Jesus withdrew from the crowds of people to get away to spend time with his heavenly father. Do you know he did that? He's God. Why did he do that? He didn't have to do that. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to spend time with his father because he needed to hear from his father. He needed to align his heart and his mind with the father. He needed to spend time with him. And if Jesus, the God of all creation, heaven and earth, if the God of the universe needs to spend time with his heavenly father, then why don't you and I? And how much more can we benefit from that? experience of every day withdrawing to him. He needed to hear words of love and life, and we do too. Let's pray. Father, we, ah, so many of us in this room may, may have struggled with or, or would struggle with this idea that you are Father. God, and none of us can do this perfectly but by your grace God we need to hear from you Lord I, I, I confess and admit my own inability to affirm the right things in the right order with my kids God may your grace cover them may your grace cover all of us God who received messages either of condemnation or affirmation in the wrong priority, in the wrong perspective. God, may every person in this room know without a shadow of a doubt that they are loved by you. That when we cry out, Abba, 
And when we cry out, Father, that you hear us, that you respond to us, and that you change and transform us and make us like you, God. Help us to receive so that we can freely give affirmation and love to those around us and to the generations that will follow. We need you, Lord. We cry out to you, God. Change us. In Jesus' name.